It's great to see you all. I've been reflecting on last uh, week, and uh, wasn't that a great Easter Sunday together? That was really, really good. And uh, JJ, oh, here he comes up the aisle here. <laughs> he, uh, JJ texted me last night. He says, I'm feeling much better, uh, but I didn't get my voice back until like Friday or so, right? And so uh, I was talking to Stephanie earlier today, and she said she really enjoyed uh, not being talked at all day. She really didn't say that. I put those words in her mouth. Yeah, but uh, it's good to see you, and it's good to know that you're feeling better. That's great. Know you were prayed for. Yeah. So uh, let's pray. Uh, those words of that song, the battle belongs to the Lord, I just kind of settled into my mind and my heart, and uh, it brings me joy this morning to know, God, that you are good, that you know, that you're powerful, that you're sovereign, that you're in control, and that you're in control of not just the the big picture of this world, but that you know each of our stories and your control lies there too. <coughs> so as we come to your word and this story uh, from your word, uh, with that in mind, I just uh, thank you. Thank you uh, that we can trust in you today. And that trust doesn't have to come with limits, but it can be complete. In fact, that's your invitation. And so by the power of your spirit, I pray you'd help me and you'd help us lean in to that trust. And we invite you, spirit, to speak. However you choose to speak this morning, we, we want to hear from you. I pray that you'd use uh, the words that uh, I speak, but I, I pray for a lot more than that. I pray that your spirit would stir our spirit for your glory. And I pray that I and that we would be willing participants to take that journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we were, are in, uh, back into Genesis, and it's uh, called The Beginnings. Uh, isn't it really neat to go and read the stories of God's words and God's truth from the beginning? And to uh, learn about ourselves, to learn about faith, to learn about human history uh, from God's viewpoint. And so that's what we've been spending time in. Uh, most recently, we've been looking at the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, they were living under the unparalleled mercy of God. It was unparalleled on the face of the earth because of God's promise to them. His God's, God's promise to them was this, I will bless you and through you, the families, the people, you and me will be blessed. So it was unparalleled because it was through them that the blessing of God would come upon not only their contemporaries, but indeed to us. Now it was uh, mercy, I said unparalleled mercy. The mercy comes in because all that God did and the promises that he made, uh, they were completely undeserved. Completely undeserved. Uh, when you think of it, as we've been talking about the, the stories of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, Abraham twice, twice put his, life, uh, his wife in a position of danger and compromise. He did it twice. And then his son, Isaac did the same, and then he brought dysfunction into his family by having favoritism. 
And then Jacob, Isaac's son, was a bit of a deceptive and fearful man. Um, not a real good character. And all these facts combined to make it true that this story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob was not so much a story of godly heritage as it was a story of mercy, a story of mercy. Now, do you remember what mercy is? Mercy is not getting what we deserve. That's what mercy is. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. And thank you, Jesus, praise you, God, that you're just as merciful today to us as you were to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because I'm as imperfect and broken as they were. Praise God for mercy. Amen? Um, but even though Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and us, are broken and in need of mercy, and God is giving us mercy, God still reserves the right to discipline. His discipline of them and us for our sin comes not out of anger, but out of concern for our own good. It reminds me of a passage in Hebrews chapter 12. It'll be up on the screen. Verses 5 and 6. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son, and I'll put in daughter, as his child. Uh, isn't that good news? That uh, God loves us so much, he'll take the time to discipline us when we wander off course. And we find this in the story of Joseph. So as much as God loves uh, to show mercy, he sometimes makes us miserable for our sin. Any of you experience the misery over sin? Yeah. Sin is a miserable, rotten thing. Let's call it for what it is. It's a miserable, rotten thing. It's kind of like a cancer that eats and then spread and then eats some more. That's kind of what sin does. And uh, God designed it so that sin would ultimately bring us to the place and the consequences of it so that we have regret, that we'll feel we, we shouldn't feel a long-term comfort in sin. We should find emptiness and misery in sin because God designed it that way. So this morning, the, the title of the message is this. Uh, God has called us for a purpose, but he has formed us for a destiny. Do you believe that, that God has a purpose for you? God has a purpose for you, and he's going to put into you what is needed for you to live out that destiny, even if it's discipline, and there will be discipline along the way. So uh, let's begin looking at this story of Joseph, Jacob's son. Uh, we find it in Genesis chapter 37, and I'm going to read the first 11 verses. Uh, they'll be up on the screen or you can use your smartphone or your Bible or however you'd like to follow along. So this is God's word from Genesis 37. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel, that's Jacob, 
loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Because he had been born to him in his own old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. And his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down before me. When he told this to his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down uh, to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. This is a story of uh, family dysfunction. That continued from one generation to the next, Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, now Joseph. It seems as uh, this generational sin revolves around favoritism and the pride and the anger and the rejection that comes with it. Jacob, now called uh, Israel, he it tells us he favored Joseph because he was born not only his own age, but if you do a little bit more digging, he was uh, born uh, by his favored wife, Rachel. And this favoritism was apparent to all. Uh, I don't think Joseph had the same workload uh, required of him. And then the day came when his dad gave him this very expensive robe to show his brothers who was the favored one, that his father favored him. It impacted Joseph. I think it impacted Joseph's character because in the story we see that he was out with his brothers and his brothers weren't working quite as hard as Joseph thought they should. And so what did Joseph do? He went and told his father on them. Wouldn't you love to have Joseph as your brother? <laughs> he had his dad's ear, and he was the one that was always running to tell on the others. Uh, it wasn't a good start for a young man who was called for a purpose. He would need to be formed in order to live out his destiny. So... Here, if we look between the lines, Joseph comes across a bit, perhaps more than a bit, a spoiled, a bit arrogant, perhaps know-it-all. And then he had these two dreams, both of which seemed to indicate that one day he would be uh, leading his family. He would not only be the leader of his brothers one day, the first dream said, but the second dream, it says the sun and moon, that was uh, the father and the mother, would bow down before him. Uh, one day, he would be the one that they'd all look toward and depend upon. Now, we have to assume that these dreams were from God uh, because 
later on in the story, you'll find that they were fulfilled in great detail. So this is for something from God. But the question is, how should Joseph have responded to the dreams? These dreams he received from God, how should he have responded? Well, I was thinking about this. Perhaps he should have taken the message of these dreams as an honor, but also knowing himself as a warning about the dangers of pride. Perhaps he should have uh, taken these insights into the future and uh, gone before God and asked God to prepare him for the leadership role that he should have. You know, historically strange dreams are often sent our way to not only show us insight into the future, but also to uh, illuminate sinful tendencies in our own lives that we need to work on. Well, uh, Joseph needed to learn humility and he needed to learn wisdom if he was going to lead well. But uh, it seems instead of learning these things, he, he was a, ma a boy of 17, he chose to further inflate his own opinion of himself, which probably most 17-year-old boys would do. But you remember Joseph was called for a purpose and he needed to be formed for a destiny. So uh, Joseph took these gifts from God, these dreams, and turned them into tools of self-promotion. And aren't we prone to do the same? Uh, to take our abilities or possessions or intelligence or our education or your good looks or even religion and have a tendency to try to use them to make us look better, to make us feel better. Think about it, what good gifts has God given you that instead of giving them to glory to God or, or to help others that you've turned them inward in the form of self-promotion? How can this make me look better? How can this give me more power? How can get this give me more influence to control others? Well, Joseph's sins came back and bit him. Let's look at the rest of the story. Chapter 37, verses 12 uh, through 36. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel, that's Jacob, said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he set him off uh, from the valley of Hebron, and when Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance. And before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer. They said to each other, come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of all his dreams. And when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. 
don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern there in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe his, he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cisterns. The cistern was empty. There's no water in it. And as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. And when Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. And he recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. That was a lot of reading, but it's an amazing story. It's an amazing story of uh, the consequences of sin. Now, you might say in a roundabout way that Joseph got what was coming to him, but let's not be too easy on the brother's sin. Their plan of revenge was even more despicable than Joseph's conceit. We find in the story that even though they had taken the robe off their brother and dumped him in the pit and they were sitting there thinking about killing him, they had the callousness of heart to do it around a meal. They were sitting there eating planning this disgusting act. Can you imagine how callous their hearts had become? Their, their feeling for their brother and their conscience before God uh, seems to have been, become completely cold. And do you know what? Uh, sin does that. God had offered a way out. You remember the story in the story, Reuben, Reuben, the oldest brother, he had some authority. He, 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 he stopped them from killing Joseph. Uh, the brothers could have come to the realization that this wasn't right. They could have said, oh, Joseph, it's just a prank. <laughs> it wasn't that funny. It's just a prank and pull him out. But, um, they didn't take that way of escape. They didn't listen to Reuben. They, they chose to put off his death. Things had spiraled out of control. And this isn't true uh, that sin has a way of spiraling out of control. Have you found that to be true? Sin has a way of spiraling out of control. The sin... Uh, that was committed by these brothers haunted them for the rest of their lives. 
If you read the rest of the story, uh, you'll find that they never got over the guilt of having sold their brother as a slave. And then to deceive their aging father. And can you imagine to watch your father go through such pain? It had gotten out of control. And it was going to impact the rest of their lives. And in fact, it changed the course of the rest of their lives. And uh, sin has a way of doing that. Especially out of control, unconfessed sin can alter the course of our lives. Yet somewhere in the midst of temptation and sin, do you know what we find? The mercy of God. God always gives us a way of escape. Look at this verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind or humankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. That's one of those verses you should always have in your back pocket. It's a promise. It's a promise from God himself that you will never be tempted in a fashion uh, whereby you cannot escape that temptation and sin. But he says he'll always give us a way out through his power and through his grace and through his mercy. That is good news. That is good news. Will you say it with me? That is good news? It is good news. Back to the story. In the midst of all this madness, Reuben, the oldest brother, stepped in and said, no, let's not kill him. But he let them throw him in a cistern. He didn't go far enough. He didn't say, this is out of control. I'm the oldest brother. This is behavior that I'm not going to tolerate. I'm going to take him back to dad. Uh, it seems in the story that Reuben said, okay, you're not going to kill him. So they threw him in a cistern. Then he got busy with a sheep or something. And then when he came back, he found that his brothers had sold him, which was probably worse than death in that day. With all the unknowns and the harsh realities, what they did to Joseph was just horrid. And Reuben, the oldest brother, instead of saying, no, this is not right, I will not tolerate it, he went halfway, but he didn't go all the way. Uh, Reuben had good intentions, let's give that to him. But out of, I don't know, fear for his brothers, of his brothers, he did not go far enough. He, he, he stood frozen in the land of good intentions while his brother was carted off to the land of slavery. And Reuben, the oldest, bore a lot of regret that he lived with for the rest of his life. What do we do with regret? Uh, I have regrets. I have regrets of not acting when I know I should have acted in one way or another. When I had good intentions, but I chose not to live out those good intentions. I think we all have regrets. Um, do you have that uh, habitual sin? that you intend to stop someday? Do you have intentions to make things right with an estranged family member or friend? 
someday? Do you intend to start reading your Bible someday? Do you intend to do what you know God has already impressed on you to do someday? Friends, now is the time. Someday isn't the time. Now is the time. Especially when it's turning away from sin. Now is the time. Because sin always takes us on a, a journey towards misery and regret. Because God does not allow us to stay content with sin. It eats away at us. That downward spiral. Because... God has called you for a purpose. He really has. God has a purpose for each and every one of us. And he is forming us for that destiny. You know, in this story, chapter 37, it seems that uh, these brothers and probably even their father, Jacob, we, we don't see that uh, they really cared that much about checking in with God. But even though it looks like the story is completely out of control and just spiraling and no place good, God was actively involved in what was happening. Um, There was that man that Joseph found along the way that told him where to find his brothers. Remember that in the story? I wonder who that man was. I wonder if it was the man that he wrestled with earlier on and God himself. I don't know. Just wondering. The, the caravan showing up when it showed up on its way to Egypt. I, I wonder if God had anything to do with that. I think so, because Joseph was called for a purpose, and he was being formed uh, for a destiny. Now, the purpose God had for Joseph, uh, I'm getting ahead a little bit in the story here. I'm sorry, uh, JJ. Uh, the purpose was to get Joseph to Egypt. God wanted Joseph to get to Egypt. And we find in uh, chapter 50, it, it even says this, that God, God's plan all the time was to get Joseph in Egypt and empower a place of influence so that he would, could keep his family from dying from a famine that was going to take place. And God knew about the famine. God is sovereign. He, he knows everything. He needed to keep this uh, family alive because you remember God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a blessing, and that blessing would be the eventual coming of Christ from his bloodline. And that blessing is to us because of Christ. There was a purpose for Joseph, but he needed to be formed for that destiny. God never lost ultimate control in the events of Genesis chapter 37. The man, the caravan, uh, Joseph's brothers, sins even. The, it was never outside of God's control. I, I think of it this way. Um, God has guardrails set up in our life and the destiny of God's guardrails are his purpose for us um, along the way in this story in chapter 37 we find that bad choices were made really bad choices were made 
but it was never out of God's ultimate control. Now, people have varying ideas of what these guardrails are. Some people, and I uh, believe that the guardrails of God are very narrow, and that God has uh, a path decided and all the details of that path decided. Other people believe that God's, God's guardrails are wider and he allows humans to make choices along the way, but they're always within these guardrails of God's love and his mercy, pointing to his purpose. That's how I kind of try to get my mind around this. Um, Joseph's brothers were trying to kill their brother. But God turned their disobedience and sin in, into a chain of events that at the end of the story would in fact save their own lives. Because chapter 50 we'll get to will tell us that. What we're talking about here is mercy God not giving us what we deserve. But we're also talking about mystery, not being able to fully understand God and his will and his ways, how he works. There's a verse in the Bible, uh, Romans 8, 28. Go ahead and put that up on the screen. It says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. God truly does all things, cause all things, including random things, including other people's sins against us, including even our own sin, God can cause all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If you are a believer of Christ, if you've called God to be your Lord, he has a purpose for you. And you can be assured that all things work together for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Now, if we really believe that, those people that sin against us, like Joseph's brothers sinned against him, we don't have to react and try to get even. We can instead forgive. And by the way, I believe forgiveness is not a one-time event. Uh, if someone does something against you, you can say, I forgive you. But I bet the next time you see them, you have that memory, you have to forgive them again. It's not a one time, you have to choose to keep forgiving. Regret over our own personal sin? Uh, yeah, I, I know that regret. We have to keep forgiving ourselves because Christ forgives in such a way as that. So these guardrails, these, these guardrails uh, keep us pointed towards a purpose. Now, you might be thinking, I hope you're not thinking this, but you might be thinking, Oh, praise God, I can go out and sin and live like I want, and there's guard well set up, and I can have a great time, and I'm going to get to the same place anyway. Not a good choice. Not a good choice, because God would much rather accomplish his good purpose through our obedience uh, rather than through our sin. He, he would rather that we walk in closeness with him 
in the safety of his presence than continually bouncing off the guardrails, getting our lives all banged up. I want to walk in safety and in God's presence. Don't you? It makes so much more sense to walk that straight walk with God, even if it might take us up and down hills and involve effort, than just to go my own independent way and get beat up along the way. And along the way saying, oh God, thank you for your mercy, I'm gonna do, and then you're over here again. That's not how God wants us to live. We'll find in Joseph's story that Joseph learned how to walk in the presence of God. The sovereignty of God in Joseph's story and indeed even in his brother's story teaches that God is bigger than our sins. God is bigger than our sins. I think you have to say amen about that. He's big enough to forgive us of our sins. We celebrated that last week. He's big enough to help us overcome temptation. And he's even big enough to clean up the mess of our sin. And then the mystery of God is this. He can even use the mess of our sin to form us so that all things work together for good. And that is mercy. None of us here have sinned in a fashion that remove us from God's mercy. All of us are called for a purpose and all of us are being formed for a destiny. His mercy and his grace are actively ours. And he calls this redemption. Redemption. Redemption can be yours in Jesus Christ. And if you've made the decision for Christ already, redemption is yours in Jesus Christ. He is actively involved. He's done everything that needs to be done. He is actively involved in your life today. May we walk in this. We are called for a purpose. And in the mercy and in the mystery of God, he forms us for our destiny. Let's pray. I just, uh, I'm in awe of you, God. I'm in awe of your will and your ways, of your grace and your mercy, of your involvement in my life, that you're never so busy that you don't know, and I'm never so far away that you won't invite me back. And uh, Spirit, Holy Spirit, we, we prayed uh, at the beginning that you'd be speaking to each of us. And uh, I pray that you'd help us to hear that individual message you have for each of us right now. And if you're sitting there in your seat right now and you think, oh, this is good news, Ted, but I think I've gone too far. I think that uh, I've gone too far. 
I need to tell you that that's a lie from the evil one. It's a lie from the evil one. And Jesus' invitation is come to me. In fact, that's the invitation from the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. Come to me, all who are thirsty. Come to him. Confess your sin. Repent of it. Change your mind about it. Turn from it. And if it seems too overpowering, ask God to help you to turn from it. We should anyway. It's what he promises he will do. Invite him into the very center of your life. And tell him that you want to walk that straight road. You're tired of bouncing off the guardrails of your own stubbornness and sin. Perhaps you're on a journey with God, but you've uh, seen a rest stop along the way and you just think you want to hang out for a while and you'll get back to it. This is the day. Trust in God. Get on his journey path and live in his presence. Perhaps there's a struggle or a hardship that just has overwhelmed you and you feel like you're stuck. God knows this. Don't let that feeling of being stuck take you to the place of not talking and depending on God. Take that next step of faith and trust in him. Thank you, God, for your mercy. Thank you, God, for your mystery. Thank you for the purpose you have for each one of us. And I thank you that you love and us enough that you're preparing us for that destiny. In Jesus' name, amen.